Uh, This morning, church family, we're going to continue in a sermon series that we started last week. Uh, Last week on Resurrection Sunday, when we celebrated the risen Savior, we started a sermon series called The Jesus Experience. And the Jesus Experience is all about how Jesus changes everything. That Jesus is a light in the darkness. That in Jesus, in our weakness, that we find strength. That in Christ, death turns to life. And that Jesus changes everything. How will he change you? And how will he change me? How will he change us as a church? Last week, we learned about how Jesus is not only the atoning sacrifice for our sins on the cross where he went to the cross to cover our sins through the blood that was shed. But we also learned about how he is our high priest. Now, a priesthood. The priesthood was established by God as a way to reconnect man with God after we were separated by sin. So Jesus doesn't just cover our sins, but because he's our high priest, he also understands our trials and our temptations. So his sacrifice is all sufficient to cover our sins, but he also understands our struggles. And then because we're talking about the Jesus experience, Jesus always takes things to the next level. It's not just that our sins are covered and that he as God understands our struggles. We also learn that he connects us directly to God, that we've been reconciled in our sin. We've been reconciled to God. We've been made right in God's eyes so that now we, as a holy priesthood of believers, because we have been made righteous, We have direct access to God. We no longer have to go through someone else. Instead, when we believe in the name of Jesus, we can boldly approach God's holy throne in our time of need to receive mercy and grace. And we looked at all the scripture last week that is associated with that. We also talked about, this has to do with Jesus' understanding. We looked at John chapter 20, and that's where we read through the resurrection story about the disciples coming and they found the empty, or Mary coming, she finds the empty tomb, she goes back, she tells the disciples, they run back, the tomb, it's empty. The disciples go away amazed and Mary stands there weeping. She stands there crying at the death of Jesus. She doesn't yet know or understand the resurrection. And Jesus, he saw her pain, he understood her pain, he called out her name, he said, Mary, And she turned to him, she cried, Rabbi, and she fell at his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus tells her, go and tell others. Go and tell my brothers. And she runs and she tells the other disciples, I have seen the Lord. So we looked at how Jesus, as our high priest, moves us in our time of despair to a time of worship. And then sends us to go tell the glory of the resurrection to others. This morning, we will continue that story. So last week was John chapter 20, verses 1 through um, through 18. And today, we're going to look at John chapter 20, verses 19 through 20. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed. When they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Today we are going to look at a portion of this passage of Scripture. There's so much we could talk about. 
How does Jesus all of a sudden show up in the middle of a locked room? Why are Jesus' disciples hiding in a locked room anyway? They've heard the message of the resurrection, yet they're still hiding in fear? Why isn't Thomas with them? There's so many questions we could be asking, but today I want us to look at simply the story of Thomas. We looked at Mary last week in her despair, and today we will look at Thomas in his doubt, and we will see how Jesus changes everything. We're going to work our way through verses 24 through 29. In those verses, it says that, uh, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. They throw in there, also known as Didymus. Didymus in the Greek simply just means twin. Disciple, uh, John, excuse me, Thomas was one of a twin. We don't know about the other twin. We don't know where he's at or what he does. We do know that Thomas is from Galilee and that he was presumably a fisherman. So maybe his twin is still back in Galilee, still continuing to fish. We don't know. We also don't know where, where Thomas was when Jesus came to the other disciples. What we do know is that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was crucified, Jesus had told the disciples to stay with him, to stay awake and continue to pray. But when the moment that Jesus was arrested came, they all fled. It's believed that Thomas was with them. It's also believed that he wasn't present at the crucifixion. It names a number of women that were there. It uh, it says that the disciple whom Jesus loved, who's often referred to as John, John the disciple was there and present. There were a few others that are named in the different accounts from the Gospels. Thomas isn't named. So we know probably that at the time of Jesus' arrest at the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's betrayed by Judas, Jesus had said, you will all abandon me, and Thomas does. So much so that he's not present during Jesus' arrest. He's not present when the Pharisees accuse him. He's not present when, he's taken, when Jesus is taken before Pilate and then he's beaten and whipped. He's not present when Jesus is led up to Golgotha and then crucified on a cross. This whole time it's believed that Thomas is not present. He's possibly hiding somewhere. Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. We can follow Jesus in our lives. We can come to church. We can be with Jesus in a sense, listening to his teachings. Thomas followed Jesus for years. There are different points where Thomas makes these big declarations about how I'll die with you. Yet when Jesus was arrested, he's betrayed, beaten, and crucified, Thomas is nowhere to be found. There are times I know in my life, and maybe you know it as well in yours, I have faith, but when it really comes down to it, when things get hard-pressed, maybe my faith is nowhere to be found. All I can see is what is happening in the world. I feel so overwhelmed that instead of running to my faith, I run away from it. Thomas was nowhere to be found. But the other disciples... The other disciples were all together, and Jesus came to them. In verse 25, it says that they tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. I'm assuming that they told him what happened, that Jesus appeared. Jesus said to look at the nail marks on his hands, that Jesus invited us to examine his body, put our hands into that spot where they thrust that spear into his side after he died. It really is the risen Jesus. He's come back. Thomas says to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, and unless I can put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Oftentimes we're harsh to Thomas and we think, well, why don't you believe the other disciples? Why does it take something so extreme for you to believe that Jesus is risen? But if we're to put ourselves in Thomas's shoes, Jesus was arrested and Thomas fled. He didn't see him beaten. He didn't see him crucified. He didn't see him die. Instead, he's told that Jesus is dead. And now he's being told that Jesus is alive. He wasn't there for any of it. It would be hard to believe. 
If you weren't raised in the church and I came to you and said, listen, there's this man, he was arrested and then beaten. He was whipped almost to the point of death. And then they nailed him to a beam and he hung until he died. Nailed through his hands. And then after he died, they thrust a spear into his side. But a couple days later, he was back. Would you believe? Now, I know that Thomas was present for miracles. He was present for Lazarus being raised from the dead. He was present for all of these things. He had walked with Jesus for years. But it would still be hard to believe that someone could undergo that and then come back. So Thomas's doubt maybe is understandable if we put ourselves in his shoes. Sometimes my doubt, it doesn't even take someone making that kind of claim. All it takes is a bad day. Sometimes it's not even a bad day. It's the bad first five minutes of a day and I milk it the whole day. And I ruin the whole day myself because I woke up maybe in a bad mood. And I allow doubt to enter in my mind. And yet we judge Thomas and say, oh, doubting Thomas. So here he is saying, listen, you experienced Jesus in that way. You saw his hands. You touched his hands. You put your hand on his side. I'm going to need to experience that as well. We can tell people about how God has answered prayer in our lives, how we've seen miracles happen, how we've seen God show up time and time again. But they're going to say, unless I can experience that, it's hard for me to believe. Now, Thomas, he's kind of a realist. In John 11, we read about how Lazarus has died, and they're going to go to where Lazarus is at in Bethany. Bethany that they were just ran out of and threatened to be stoned to death. And Thomas says, well, fine, let's all go and we'll die with him. He's willing to be put to the test, but at the same time, he realizes that there's a way that the world works. And if we go there, we're going to die too. In John 14, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know the way to where I'm going. And he starts talking about how he's going to be ascended and the disciples, that they'll end up coming to him. And Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? He's a realist. He wants an A, B, C, D kind of faith. You show me the way and I'll walk that path, Lord. I am very much like Thomas. And if you think about it, maybe you are too. When there's a, a juncture in your life where you have to make a choice about which way am I going to go. God, you show me the way. I think God has probably already showed you the way. But still we have to question and still we have to wonder. Why don't you just give me the A, B, C, D kind of steps to take? Thomas just wants to have the experience the other disciples have. You got to touch his hands. It's hard for me because I can't. You put your hand into his side and yet he stood there living among you. I wasn't there. So what does Thomas do? And here's where I think many times we get it wrong. The disciples had an experience. Maybe people in our lives and in our church, they have an experience with Christ, but we don't. And so we stop coming back. In verse 26, it says eight days later, or a week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Thomas was with them. Now he had hid and ran, or he had ran in fear and hid. He wasn't present for all these things that had happened. And yet we call, him, we call him doubting Thomas so much, but yet he must have believed in some way because he still continues to stay with the disciples. He doesn't abandon his faith entirely. He doesn't abandon the body of believers. A week later, Thomas was still with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Hopefully that sounds familiar because we just read it. In the same way that Jesus showed up to the disciples when Thomas wasn't there, he now shows up when Thomas is there in the exact same way. And then he said to Thomas, like he said to the group of disciples, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. But then he says, stop doubting and believe. Believe. 
If I'm honest with you, I think that there's something very, very important, not just in the stop doubting and believe, but in the same way that when Jesus showed up to those who maybe considered themselves faithful, he showed up in the exact same way to Thomas, who was seen as full of doubt. The same experience that the disciples had, Thomas, Thomas now gets to have. If you ever feel like your doubt is going to stop you from coming to church or continuing to connect with God or continuing to go to the Lord because, God, I want these experiences that other people have had. If we isolate ourselves and if we stop, if we just, well, I'll just quit going to church because it's not changing anything. I'll stop talking with the other people that go to church because what's the point? If Thomas had done that, he never would have experienced the risen Christ. Even though we consider Thomas a person full of doubt, apparently he had enough belief to stay and he experienced Jesus in the same way the others had. So here we have Thomas. Jesus appears to him, invites him to do this, and he says, do not doubt, but believe. His invitation to all doubters, I think, is the same as Thomas. Investigate it for yourself. Other people have made these claims that God shows up in their lives. Why don't you try it? Why don't you try to connect with him in prayer? Start reading in scripture. Start living a life above sin and you will be amazed at how Jesus shows up. Like Thomas, we are invited to draw near to the Lord and experience what others have experienced. And then Jesus says, do not doubt but believe. What I think is a powerful verse that is oftentimes a troubling verse to others. Many times it's problematic because people now become fearful when they experience momentary doubt. They think, well, I can't doubt because Jesus will rebuke me. And and so we have this idea that faith is this static, unmoving thing. And if we waver from faith, then we're stuck in doubt. The reality is the word doubt and the word believe, they're the exact same word with a different prefix. In Greek, one letter can change the meaning of a word. In Greek, pistis means faith or belief. And because Jesus is saying to Thomas, saying you believe, it's pistos. So he says apistos and pistos. Stop unbelieving and believe. But the way that he says it in the Greek, the way that we have it recorded in our scripture, if you really dig into this, all this science behind textual criticism and understanding languages and the semantic structure behind everything, and I'm going to nerd out on you for a second, but I think it's important. <laughs> it's used in what's called an imperfect tense in the Greek. And there there are seven tenses in ancient Greek, and they have two different inflection families. There's primary tenses and secondary tenses. And then the general, a primary tense refers to an action in the present or future. The secondary refers to a past. But the fact that it's imperfect means that it's something that happened in the past that continues to happen, and it's still going on into the present. And if we allow it, it'll move on into the future. So it's something that happened in the past, It's continuing to happen now, and there's a possibility that it can continue into the future. So when Jesus says to Thomas, apistos and pistos, stop doubting and believe, the words apistos and the word pistos are practically right next to each other. And the reason that this is important is because you're not stuck in doubt and you're not stuck in faith. Instead, because it's this continuous action that is going on, you're either moving toward doubt or you're moving toward faith. You can never achieve faith 100%. Instead, it grows and it grows and it grows. And if you have a moment of doubt, you move a little bit further away from faith toward doubt, but you're still in faith. Or if you're a person that's full of doubt... Just because you believe for a moment doesn't mean that you stop being full of doubt. It goes back and forth. Doubt is not this fixed thing. So if in your life, if you feel like I have, I have doubted all of my life, that does not mean you do not have faith and that you can never have faith. Jesus is 
rebuke almost to Thomas. They stop moving away from faith and move back toward it. If you're full of doubt, that doesn't mean your faith cannot grow. So when Jesus tells Thomas, when he says, stop doubting, he's saying, you've been moving away from the faith that you had in me. Now move back toward it. Because, you, because you've experienced this, move back toward faith. And what is Thomas's response? What does he do? In Scripture, if we look at the artwork that people have, you know, when they're moved by Scripture, they make these grandiose drawings and paintings. We often see something that it'll say, Doubting Thomas. And it'll be this picture of Thomas inspecting Jesus' wounds. In Scripture, it talks about the other disciples touching his hands, putting them on his side. We don't see that with Thomas. Instead, we have the invitation by Jesus. We have this admonition, stop moving toward doubt and move toward faith. And Thomas's response is that he cries out to Jesus. He says to him, my Lord and my God. It never says that he touches his hands. It never says that he puts his hands into his side. Instead, he turns toward him and he cries out, my Lord and my God. And we might, we might read this and miss the importance. This is an exclamation. In fact, it's the first proclamation, the first confession that Jesus is God. So far, Jesus has been called the Son of God, which is part of the, our Trinitarian understanding is very important. But in that day and age, the Son of God is different than being a God. And so Thomas isn't saying you are a God or the Son of a God. Thomas is saying, my Lord and my God. Jesus, you are on the same level as God the Father. It is an exclamation of Jesus' divinity. This enlightened statement by Thomas is considered to be among the greatest confessions ever made about who Jesus is. And it comes from a man that we refer to as Doubting Thomas. And I think that is so important. That a person moving toward doubt, when he experienced the risen Savior, makes the first and possibly the greatest exclamation of who Jesus is. My Lord and my God. So when Mary stood at the empty tomb weeping in despair, Jesus called out her name. And when she had realized that Jesus was risen from the dead, she cried out, Rabbi, or teacher. And she fell to his feet and she worshipped him. Her tears of despair turned to tears of joy. Thomas, who had been someone who abandoned Jesus, who hid while Jesus was crucified, who remained in hiding while other disciples gathered together. Thomas, in his doubt, who was moving further and further away from faith, when he experienced Christ, he cried out, my Lord and my God. Mary in her despair, Thomas in his doubt, Jesus comes to them both, and they both declare who he is. He's the risen Savior. But it doesn't stop there. And that's why we're calling this the Jesus experience. If that's all it was, our faith would be encouraged. But Jesus takes it a step further. And in verse 29, Jesus says, Then Jesus told them, or told him, Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those, Thomas, who will come after you, who will believe not because they see me, but because after I'm ascended, they will believe because of your testimony. Blessed are those generations to come that will believe not because I'm standing in front of them where they can touch my hands or see and put their hand into my side, but because they believe by the witness of those who have come before. Blessed are those who will experience miracles and share those miracles with others around them. Miracles of addictions being broken. 
of a life that has been full of debt and crime and everything else that has been washed clean and they walk away from it. Even small things where we bear witness that this week God resurrected my heart. I was stuck in fear. I was stuck in failure. And I asked the Lord to come to me and I'm full of life and hope. Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. If you're a person who struggles with doubt, realize that when Jesus came to Thomas, Thomas's exclamation was to declare him Lord of all. My Lord and my God. Mary in her despair found joy and hope. What will Jesus change in you today? What will he change in you tomorrow? And what will happen that moves you more and more into a life of faith? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this testimony and this witness that we can read in your word. We are thankful that, that even though it's not a joy to read about someone in doubt, we're thankful that we can have just such a real witness that Thomas was moving toward doubt. But when he experienced you, he was moved to such profound faith. A faith that echoes into today and further into the future. Help us to be a people that even if we struggle with doubt, if we struggle with fear or failure, whatever is holding us back from fully surrendering to you, Lord, that we would turn to you. And that when we see you before us, when we fall to our knees at the cross, when we are lifted up by you because you have been risen, that we would cry out, you are my Lord and my God. I give you all. Father, help us to do that each day and glorify your name. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen.